All right, guys, in this video, we're gonna go over fuel systems. We're gonna talk about carburetors versus EFI, fuel pumps, electric versus mechanical. We're gonna talk about fuel pressure regulators. We're gonna talk about lines, filters, troubleshooting, and to make your life easier, we're gonna go ahead and in the description, we're gonna put a link. So all you have to do is if you're only interested in lines, click on that link and it'll take you just to those. Hey guys, what's going on? I'm not exactly sure what the weather's like where you guys are at, but I know here for the last couple weeks, it's been raining what seems to be every day. The weather's really crappy. We're waiting on a couple parts for the car. So what do you do? If you're someone like me, I guess you take your favorite picture of your 68, you take your favorite picture of your 04, you give it to your friend who's a tattoo guy and you say, come up with something. So I went and spent five and a half hours there the other day. I got this done. As you can see, it still needs all the shading and everything, but I'll go back in a couple weeks, we'll throw in another couple hours and see how far we can get. The good weather is coming, supposedly, so let's try and get this thing done, let's get the car done, and go out and enjoy what we can. Before we get too far into all the other stuff, let's start talking about some ethanol. Ethanol is not a problem for vehicles that are built after 2003. A lot of stuff still is not made to run e E15. We know that things built before 2003 have an issue with ethanol. It starts to cause failures of soft parts, you know, hoses, diaphragms, O-rings, the inside of an injector, that type of stuff. The best way that you can protect your vehicle is use the fuel that it was designed to burn. For older vehicles, avoid ethanol gas. If you're going to use that, you need to make sure that you're installing parts that are compatible. Okay guys, so now we've talked about ethanol, let's talk about octane. Some things that people believe are true with Octane is it's increased horsepower, it's gonna increase your mileage, it runs a lot cleaner. These are all just myths. If you run 91, 94 Octane in a motor that was designed for 87 Octane, it may even reduce your performance. It's not gonna help. Hard, octane makes fuel harder to ignite, which again is another myth. Everybody thinks 94 Octane ignites way sooner. It's absolutely the opposite. In some high performance motors, the temperature alone that is involved with that makes it makes the fuel ignite before you want it to, before your spark tells it to. And that's called pinging or detonation. Check out what that does to a piston right here. All right guys, now that we have ethanol and octane out of the way, where do we start with a fuel system? To start a fuel system, you need to know how much horsepower you want to build. After that, you need to know, am I going carbureted or EFI? That's a big one. Next thing, am I going to be naturally aspirated or boosted? All of these things together will help you design the fuel system for what you require. Again, anything that you're trying to do here is a simple equation. It's energy in versus energy out. All you want to know is how much horsepower so you can make sure that you have all of that fuel getting up to it. The bigger horsepower number, the bigger fuel demands that your motor is going to require. All right guys, so let's start the age old debate. Carburetors versus EFI system. Make sure, again, you know that horsepower rating. Everything has a range that it's designed to work within. When you're installing a carburetor that is too big or too small, it's not going to be able to give you the peak performance for that engine. The same thing for a fuel injector. You don't want to be too big, too small for your horsepower goals or the demand you have on it, naturally aspirated or boosted. Make sure if you don't know, you call the manufacturer and get their recommendation. If you're going to be running a carburetor, the fuel pressure is very low, 5 to 8 PSI. Too high, you're going to push fuel past the float and you're going to flood the motor. Too low, you're going to pull all the fuel out of those bowls and it's going to run lean and shut off. Same thing with a fuel injection system. It runs a much higher pressure, anywhere between 30 PSI up to 80 or 90 PSI. But again, you want to make sure that you're talking with that manufacturer and you get the proper parts that are designed to work together. So if you're trying to size an injector, you don't really know what you need, here's an online calculator you can click on. It's a couple quick questions and it'll help you get in the ballpark of what you need. All right guys, so we got a couple things out of the way. Now we're onto a fuel pump. What do we need for each and every application? The much older style cars, like my 68 originally, had a mechanical pump. 
That would be great for a stock or a mild performance application. But once you start getting into real high horsepower stuff, there's not a lot of guys running mechanical pumps anymore. All your daily drivers, the majority of them, will all be a electric pump. Most of those have a return line already. So you can see how it, you know, technology is pushing us in that direction. Fuel pump placement. You need to make sure that the fuel pump is placed back at the tank. It doesn't have the ability to draw fuel all the way, say if you put it at the front. You want the fuel pressure in the tank, the weight of that fuel, to help push it down into the pump. Pumps are really good at pushing fuel, they're not good at pulling it. Make sure it's at the back. The next thing, you want to make sure that you have the correct size pump. This goes back again to horsepower that you're expecting. This also goes back to carburetor or EFI. You need to know what pressures you need to be running. So let's say you're going to be running an electric fuel pump. What are some of the things that you need to consider? Well, yes, of course, you can go key on and you have power that goes to that pump. But what happens, God forbid, if you were in an accident? If you're in an accident, knocked unconscious, the ignition's still on, you have fuel just pouring out, which may be into a fire. It's not really ideal. So if you have a system like ours, it already has technology built in where if the motor's off, it will not let that pump run. If I'm ever in an accident, the car flips over, anything like that, it's gonna shut that pump off and hopefully give me enough time to get out of the car. Something to consider if you're going to be running an electric pump. Mechanicals, they run off the engine. So if the motor dies when you flip over, whatever, it's gonna shut that off and it's gonna kill the fuel pressure. If you're going to be looking for an electronic or an electric fuel pump calculator, here's one right here. Again, you can go in and do a couple simple questions and it'll give you a ballpark of where you should be looking to help you size that pump out. Next thing in line, what do we have to talk about? Fuel lines. We know we're gonna be running carburetor or EFI. We have a rough idea on the pump that we need. So what's next? Fuel lines are here. So there's tons of different things you need to consider. One, the operating temperature. If you need a flexible or not. Again, flexible hoses can crack or, you know, kind of deteriorate if you're bending them around and they're right beside a header, for example. Following that, what do we need to consider? What type of fuel are we gonna be running? Alcohol, ethanol, normal pump gas, you know, all of these things come into play. What size we need, the material. Do you want galvanized metal? Do you want, you know, AN braided lines? Do you want copper? Do you want neoprene? Do you want Teflon? There's a ton of different options out there. Again, steel is the most common. It's the easiest. You can just route it right through. There's little resistance, super low cost, and you just run. Copper, lots of people used to run copper. It's not super common anymore, but you do see it in the hot rods or rat rods and that kind of stuff. The problem with copper is it becomes brittle when the vibration gets to it. So it'll start kind of, you know, tweaking around with just um, the vibrations of the engine. It may crack and start leaking everywhere. Poly lines, AN lines, they're great, but if you throw them anywhere near heat, you may get into an issue. Neoprene. neoprene. Neoprene is great under 50 PSI. You don't really want to run 80, 90, 100 PSI through those. And what style of clamps are you going to be using? For us, we're running all braided hose with AN fittings. Let's start talking about fuel pumps. If you're going to be running an electric pump, a lot of them need a return style. So you're going to need a return line that comes back to the tank. Maybe that's something you do or do not have. That's something you need to consider. The next thing is what am I going to be doing for connections? Do I want to spend all the money in an AN fitting or an AN coupling and so on and so on. You want to make sure that what you start with, you're going to carry through the whole project. There's nothing worse than having a bunch of different fittings on the same car. Lastly, routing. You want to make sure that all of the routing that you are going to be going from the front to the back is away from exhaust, away from suspension components. It's not somewhere that's hanging underneath. So when you put a jack under the car, you don't go ahead and cut right through your line. All of these things need to be considered. You want to make sure you have the proper tools. If you're going to be using a steel line, you need to make sure you can bend it. If there's a kink in it, stop, scrap the piece and start over. Again, fuel system is not something that you want to, you know, go ahead and half-ass. Make sure that you have a small 
number of bends as possible. You don't want to have a 90 to a 90 to a 35 that's going to kind of get up to the motor. All of these bends make it harder for your fuel to flow. The more kind of sweeping bends that you have, the better it will run. Flexible lines, make sure you have the right product. Again, for us, we went to Red Horse Fittings. They have all of our lines, hoses, ends, everything that we need to do it and make sure you get it all from the same manufacturer. Russell fittings may not work with Red Horse lines. Earl's fittings may not work with Russell lines. You can get a leak. Buy everything from the same manufacturer start to finish. Trust me, it'll save you a lot of time in the end. So if you're someone like us who's taking a stock car that made 190-ish horsepower and you're trying to get up near that 1,000 horsepower mark, obviously you need to change lines. What size line do you want? Here's a small, brief description of what you should be looking for for each horsepower goal. While we're on the topic of lines, let's go ahead and talk about what we did on our application, the 68 Mustang. We need a big diameter, obviously, we're trying to feed a lot of horsepower. So maybe that steel line like we were talking about, that's kind of like a brake line, maybe that wouldn't be ideal. You can get stainless and aluminum line like that, but it's kind of hard to bend it all nice without proper specialized tooling. So what we chose to do was run rubber braided or steel braided fuel line. The pros and cons with each of these, this is a steel braid, as you can see, it's shiny metal. When you go in and cut it and install your fittings, you will get cut. All these little wires kind of flare out like this, and as you're shoving that fitting on there, you're going to bleed profusely. So I chose the fabric braid. I also like the black line compared to the silver on our vehicle. So I chose this fabric braid. It cuts down on how much you are going to get um, you know, injured while you're trying to install all these fittings, but it also gives me the look that I wanted. A con to this is it's pretty soft. If it's underneath your vehicle, a rock or a stick or something like that could come up and puncture this line, where with the steel on the outside of this one, it kind of just deflects all that stuff. So to combat that, I ran a piece of rubber heater hose over top of this all the way underneath the car. Also, you want to make sure that if you're close to an exhaust pipe or something, this will melt a lot easier than the outside of this steel. So what I did was I ran heat shielding. It's just like a little sock that goes over top. I ran heat shielding anywhere I was within four inches of the exhaust on this vehicle. So those are some of the things that I did on my car. And I think there's enough videos out there on how to install these AN fittings on the end of your line. What do you guys think? Should I go ahead and make a video and show you how we do it on ours? Drop it in the comments below. And if you guys want it, we'll make a video for you, no problem. So we've had some questions regarding fuel pressure regulators. Let's go through and talk about what is required there. You need to again know if it's carbureted or EFI. Everything has a working range and they are not the same components. So once you decide that, you can decide which path you're going to go down. If you do not know which regulator you need, make sure you contact the manufacturer and they can help guide you in the right direction. Regulators are kind of cool. They're user adjustable. I can adjust from five to eight PSI or 40 to 70 PSI. So you set it to your vehicle and the lines and everything that you have. It has a little set screw on the top, just feel free to turn that. What's gonna happen if your fuel pressure is too low? Fuel pressure too low is gonna cause misfires, rough idle, unresponsive uh, throttle, and stalling. So those are some of the things to be careful for. What happens if it's too high? It's going to run rich, your engine. It's gonna be blowing smoke out the back, it's gonna burn your eyes, that kind of stuff. It's gonna foul plugs, it's gonna have stalling. The exhaust may be super dark and have a ton of carbon in it. These are just some quick and easy things that you can look at and say, oh, maybe my fuel pressure is a little bit high. Adjust that little knob on the top. So we've talked about now fuel pressure regulators. What's left in this fuel system? Well, of course you're gonna need filters. So what do we know about trying to size a filter? Well, you need to know what size line you're running. Obviously that's a big one. You need to know what kind of flow you're getting from the fuel pump. Again, that's a big one. Lastly, you wanna know what size media you need in that filter, what size micron it's going to filter to. For me, I run a 10 micron before the pump. That's gonna take out all the big stuff that's in the tank. Then I hit my pump and after the pump, I run a five micron. It's about half the size and I know that that is the actual manufacturer's recommendation for the parts that I'm using. 
Anything smaller than that, I mean, I can filter down to one micron if I wanted, but the manufacturer says five, that's what I'm gonna run with. You've all seen those little plastic or glass fuel filters, you know, for a lawnmower or something, and you see these guys that run them on top of the engine. You can do what you like, I hate seeing it. Those things are prone to fail, especially with all the heat that's going on under that hood. I couldn't even imagine having a $4 filter leak and burn your car down. You know, these things are great for testing. If you think you have a problem, you know, troubleshooting, that kind of stuff. But I wouldn't leave it on there permanently. So try and get a filter that is designed for that application or the heat or, you know, things like that instead of a little piece of plastic that can burn your car down. Everybody talks about magnets. Should we put a magnet on there? You know, it's kind of gimmicky to me. If you watched our last video for the fuel tank modifications, you saw me drill and weld and that kind of stuff. I do have a magnet on the bottom of that tank, but that's because I introduced a whole bunch of shavings into a new tank. If it's your daily driver, putting a magnet on there probably isn't going to do anything. All the new vehicles have a plastic tank and it's not going to trap dirt or a rock or anything like that. That is actually what the filter is for. Let it do its job and forget the magnets. So the last thing that I want to talk about with fuel filters is I've tried to do a lot of research and find out what are some really good fuel filters, what are some not so good ones. We all know the Fram oil filter debate, so I was wondering if there's something like that going on. I couldn't find a lot of information out there, so I'm asking you guys, what do you use, dislike, have had problems with in the past? Let's see what everybody uses for a fuel filter. So throw it in the comments below. Hopefully you guys found this video helpful. If you did like it, let us know, hit that thumbs up button. If we miss something, throw it in the comments below and we'll answer each and every question. If you wanna see us make that video for the AN fittings, make sure to tell us if there's enough of them out there and you guys don't need to see it, it's not a problem as well. Lastly, if you are enjoying this series, please hit that subscribe button. We could use every one of them. And make sure the notification button is on. The reason I'm saying that and the reason I have been saying it is we are going to get to start this vehicle. If your notification button is on, you will be the first one to know. And that may or may not be the next video. We are going to try and get it running for the next video, which may be today, maybe it's in a week. You won't know unless you hit that button. Time for me to get the hell out of here and get on this car so we can start using it. Have a good one.